Welcome, I'm Lee Cowan and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Tom Selleck's 14 year run on CBS's hit drama Blue Buds might be coming to an end. More on that later in the show, but his big break came back in the 80s when he and that iconic mustache starred as Magnum P.I. As he recalled to Tracy Smith, it was on that show he got one of his most unique requests from a guest star. Among its biggest fans, Frank Sinatra, who once told Magnum co-star Larry Minetti that he'd like to be on the show. And Larry comes to me and says, Frank wants to do the show. And he said, but um, he wants to be asked, so you have to call him. And he wanted to do it right away. So I said, well, we're going to have to write it for you. <laughs> what, what do you want to do? He said, oh, I don't care. Just make sure I get to beat somebody up. That was his condition. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, well, that's Frank. Later in the show, Tom Selleck on seeking good roles rather than just glitz and glamour. You say flat out in the book, I don't want to be famous, I want to be a good actor. I, yeah, and I started to, <laughs> I, I, look, I've, I've always been somewhat private, and um, by the time I got Magnum, I realized uh, Magnum was a long journey, which you find out in the book. It was a very melancholy time for me. I was stuck in Hawaii, the actors were on strike, I had to give up Raiders, and but I knew even if Magnum wasn't successful when it finally got on the air um, and it got canceled, my whole life would change. And I, I, I did not welcome that. And so I've been blessed all along. I've been blessed by a lot of failure. Then we meet Italian sculptor Jacopo Iago Cardillo. Our Seth Doan got a behind the scenes look at the artist's most ambitious project yet. A six ton, more than 16 foot sculpture. And while some have called him a young Michelangelo, Cardillo says he wants his work to be considered incomparable. He's unveiling humankind and making headlines with his contemporary approach to this classical art form. You've been called a young Michelangelo. Please don't say that. Why do, why do you not like that? I don't want to be the next, uh, you know, someone. I want to be the next myself. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. As we alluded to at the top of the show, Tom Selleck has spent more than a decade portraying head of the NYPD, Frank Reagan, on CBS's Blue Bloods. The series finale is expected to air later this year. But Selleck told our Tracy Smith he isn't quite ready to turn his badge in quite yet. Watch your step. There's no handrail. It is a little steep. On the highest hill at Tom Selleck's California ranch, it's hard to beat the panorama. I tell you, for a guy who values his privacy, you couldn't pick a better spot than this. Thank you. At 79, you could say the actor is very familiar with the view from the top. Hey, come on. Don't overthink this, guys. You're as tough as they come. For the past 14 years, Selleck has starred in the hit CBS show, Blue Bloods, as the head of the NYPD, and the head of a strong and often headstrong family. I knew that you and dad would be for that rule even if it wasn't actually a rule. But the rule does make enormous sense. The show is set to end this year, but there's been some pushback on that, most notably from Selleck himself. Is Blue Bloods ending? Well, that's a good question. I will continue to think that CBS will come to their senses. We're the third highest scripted show in all of broadcast. We're winning the night. All the cast wants to come back. And I can tell you this, we aren't sliding off down a cliff. We're doing good shows and still holding our place. So I don't know, you tell me. <laughs> it's not the first time Tom Selleck has been at odds with the powers that be in a career that's been long and legendary. <laughs> most famous role in the 80s, the character Thomas Magnum wore a Detroit Tigers baseball cap. That's a nod to the town in which Tom Selleck himself was born. Long before Magnum, 
and the mustache. He was an athlete at the University of Southern California. And after a less than stellar academic career, he found work in ads. People are switching to Band Basic. Selling products like Band Basic and Bar Soap. Safeguard doesn't need heavy perfume to mask odor. Good morning. Good morning. He smells just the way a man should smell. Clean. Yep, that's Terry Garr and Penny Marshall, back when they were all young and struggling. You told yourself early on going to auditions and interviews, you would literally say to yourself in the car, you're good enough, Tom. I'd say you're enough, but that's, thank you. I, maybe that good would have helped, but I didn't think of that. <laughs> but you're enough, Tom. You'd say that to yourself. I did. I did. But little of what he did in his early career was ever enough. Not the soap opera gig. I could use a little transfusion, this for me. Or the six TV pilots he made. And then he was signed to do Magnum P.I. And around the same time, Selleck was offered another role from Steven Spielberg. Steven said, here's the script, go read it. Tell me if you like it, because we want you for Indiana Jones. So I got to about page eight in Steven's office, and I just went, oh, <laughs> this is really good. But in a story that's become legend, he was forced to turn down Raiders of the Lost Ark for Magnum. In a long-awaited memoir, Selleck shares the details of what he calls the World Series of Disappointments and how he quickly made peace with it. You can make yourself a victim or just smile and say, that's really ironic. And you chose to smile? I had a good job coming up, a job I would have dreamed of, uh, Raiders or not. Magnum P.I. debuted in 1980 on CBS, about a former Navy SEAL and Vietnam vet turned private investigator. The studio wanted to lose the Vietnam element. Back then, the wounds of the war were still fresh, but Selleck and his producer fought hard to keep it in, and the show was a hit. Among its biggest fans, Frank Sinatra, who once told Magnum co-star Larry Minetti that he'd like to be on the show. And Larry comes to me and says, Frank wants to do the show. And he said, but um, he wants to be asked, so you have to call him. And he wanted to do it right away. So I said, well, we're going to have to write it for you. <laughs> what, what do you want to do? He said, oh, I don't care. Just make sure I get to beat somebody up. That was his condition. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, that's Frank. Goheny! The Magnum P.I. guest shot was Sinatra's last acting job. We got him, honey. But it was only the beginning of Tom Selleck's reign as an 80s sex symbol. That smile, that swagger, that mustache. In private, however, Selleck was smitten by British actor Jilly Mack, whom he first spotted when she was in the London production of Cats. I got checked out by some of the cast, never Jilly. One of the cast members told her at halftime, he says, you know who keeps staring at you? Tom Selleck. And uh, I don't know how to clean this up. She just said, who the f is that? Um, she didn't know who I was from Adam, which to me was the greatest thing in the world. They married in secret in 1987, just before Magnum entered its final season. They've been together ever since. By that time, Selleck says he was burned out, but he knew he'd helped create something that was more than just a TV show. When Magnum ended, we got a call from the Smithsonian, and they said, uh, we want to honor Magnum. We need some artifacts, and they took my hat and my, the ring I wore, the team ring in Vietnam, and. Uh, my Hawaiian shirt, the red one. And we went back there and they read the citation. They gave us credit for being the first show that showed Vietnam veterans in a positive light. So the fight was worth it. He said it was for him. These days, he spends most of his non-working time on his ranch, and it's not hard to see why. You know, hopefully I'll keep working enough to hold on to the place. Seriously, that's an issue? If you stopped it's working? It's always an issue. If I stop working? Yeah. Am I set for life? Yeah, but maybe not on a 63-acre ranch. Happily, he likes his job. And after 60 years in front of the camera, 
Tom Selleck knows he's enough. So bigger picture, when you look down the road, what do you see? Hopefully work. As an actor, you never lose, I don't lose anyway, in the sense that every time I finish a job, it's my last job. Do you still have that sense? I like the fact that there's no excuses. <laughs> you just go to work, and you do the work, and I have a, a lot of reverence for what I call the work. And I love it, and uh, I'd like to keep doing it. After the break, an exclusive excerpt from Tracy Smith's chat with Tom Selleck, something you can only see right here on Here Comes the Sun. Stay with us. Failure is your friend if you make friends with it. As promised, here's more with Tom Selleck and Tracy Smith. Your dad, yeah. when you came to him and said, Dad, I want to leave USC and do this <laughs> acting program. Yeah. Here's this man who had worked all of his life and just wanted you to have a job and, and had helped you get into college. Yeah. But he said to you, you should do it because you don't want to have what ifs. I went to him. He didn't know about my academic problems. But uh, I told him I was offered uh, this contract. And uh, my brother Bob played professional baseball. And he had signed with the Dodgers. Tommy Lasorda signed him. And uh, he thought for a minute, because I had to quit a job. I was uh, in a management training program for United Airlines. They didn't know about my academic record either. He just thought for a minute, and he said, I think it's like your brother Bob. He said, it's a kind of opportunity that's considered special. And if you don't, try it, you may get to be about 35 and wonder what if. It was kind of, and he said, but you got to call your boss and quit your job. I was hoping he'd call. <laughs> <laughs> but no, that's not my dad. And um, I, I started to leave, thanks dad. And I just heard him. He wasn't talking to himself and he wasn't really talking to me. And he said, uh, just don't let them change you. So he had taken a risk in giving that advice, but he gave it fully um, without any caution. But he knew he had uh, been selling real estate in California and L.A. <laughs> And he knew the Hollywood stories and everything, and obviously it was a concern. And I guess that's where that came from. But he didn't say it for me to hear. I just heard it. Do you think you honored his advice? Just don't let him change you? Yeah. As much as I can or could, yeah. You say flat out in the book, I don't want to be famous. I want to be a good actor. I, yeah, and I started to... <laughs> I, I, look, I, I've always been somewhat private, and um, by the time I got Magnum, I realized uh, Magnum was a long journey, which you find out in the book. It was a very melancholy time for me. I was stuck in Hawaii. The actors were on strike. I had to give up Raiders, and, but I knew even if Magnum wasn't successful when it finally got on the air um, and it got canceled, my whole life would change, and I, I, I did not welcome that. And so I've been blessed all along. I've been blessed by a lot of failure. Failure is your friend if you make friends with it, because um, that's the teacher. And I, had, I was well equipped for that. Not my academics, that's <laughs> kind of pitiful, but the sports I played. Um, I played sports, I wanted to be an athlete, I wanted to be a professional baseball player. And all the teams I played on were losing teams. Our high school teams um, in junior college at SC, we kept losing to Lou Alcindor, who became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Um, you, you become very familiar in sports with failure. You can have successes or failures in one um, sit down. 
so, uh, and I, that was an, a, another serendipitous piece of luck to make me understand um, the journey as an actor. I never really questioned it. Up next, we meet what you might call the ultimate rock star. Welcome back. Sculptor Yago's timeless technique, combined with an active presence on social media, has made his work more accessible to younger generations and earned him legions of fans, including none other than Whoopi Goldberg. Seth Doan met the man behind the hammer and the chisel. This marble baby sculpture called Look Down, meant to draw attention to the vulnerability of the unhoused, was installed in New York. While the Italian sculptor may not yet be a household name in the U.S., the woman who helped get it here is. Everybody started out as this baby. This journey involving Whoopi Goldberg takes us to Naples in a sprawling shipyard studio. A wonderful place, the perfect place where I can make dust noise where 37-year-old sculptor Jacopo Cardillo, better known in his native Italy simply as Iago, is working on his most ambitious project yet, carving away 20 tons of marble to create what'll be a six-ton, more than 16-foot-tall sculpture. It's nerve-wracking. You can't make any mistakes. Well, you can. Maybe I made 100 mistakes. You'd not think that looking around his studio. The artist has sent a piece to the International Space Station. He exhibited at the Venice Biennale at just 24 years old and won a medal for an earlier version of this. Hello, ma'am. There he is, the Pope. A bust of Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, initially wearing his cloak, a piece Iago says he never really liked. There were no one piece of freedom in that portrait. So you decided to take the Pope's clothes off? Well, when the Pope decided to retire, it was an incredible excuse to go back to the work, unveiling what behind the humankind. He's unveiling humankind and making headlines with his contemporary approach to this classical art form. You've been called the young Michelangelo. Please don't say that. Why? <laughs> Why do you not like that? I don't want to be the next, uh, you know, someone. I want to be the next myself. One key implement he uses is social media to expose his process, a technique that's centuries old. He draws dots as reference points on a full-scale plaster cast. You have pixel, right? More pixel, more quality definition. Then moves a frame from the cast, fitting it into the same place in the marble. The tool pinpoints how deep to carve. Now I'm here, and now I go, go close. You see? You miss this half centimeter. It's in those final details, those last millimeters. Yeah, of course. Imagine your face, my face. Every millimeters matter. In those last millimeters, he's created masterpieces, some displayed in his church-turned-museum in Naples' Sanita neighborhood. It's home to his Narcissus, his take on Venus. We are so connected with this idea that there is an age to be Venus, but that's, that's not true. It's a myth. And it's where Iago welcomed a group of teens oh. who'd beaten up that marble baby in a Naples piazza in 2020, not long after he finished work on it in a studio in New York. I says, listen, guy, with the same chisel and hammer, you can broke something or you can build something. And then he whips out the tools, and I thought, OK, this is, this is how you show them. Uh -huh. That story of embracing the teens piqued the interest of Whoopi Goldberg. Usually you think of you as the celebrity. In this case, right. you're the fan. I am a huge fan. She was touched by the humanity of the whole thing. There is a lot of heart in the midst of it. And I want us to see our better selves in these art pieces. So I wanted it to be here because I think New Yorkers get it. Having this baby returned to New York kind of completes a circle. Maybe it's just a step. Baby needs to grow. As Iago grows, he'd like to create a new museum, maybe in the U.S., 
He prefers to speak through his sculptures, etching and evoking emotions that may not always need to be explained. It's like when you try to explain a poetry. Poetry, there's many ways to understand the poetry, like love, for example. You found in love. If you try to explain at that moment, maybe you destroy the poetry. Okay? Maybe shut up okay? and feel. I'm Lee Cowan. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Here Comes the Sun.